Gail Singer, founder and president of Circle Lighting, and I'd like to welcome you to today's first international virtual book signing and panel. Originally, we had this planned in our new London showroom at the Chelsea Design Center, but Zoom will have to do for now, as it's done for everything else we seem to be doing these days. So we're very excited to have India Hicks and Editor-in-Chief Martina Mandarati to, um, I know I just butchered your name, Martina, I'm sorry, Mandadori, in conversation with India's latest book, um, entertaining story, and uh, I'm sorry, India Hicks, an entertaining story, which the first lucky 50 registrants and attendees will receive a free copy of. So just in time for the holidays. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Martina and take it away and everybody else enjoy. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Gail, and thank you everyone for um, tuning in and watching. I feel, it feels always a bit weird, although we're now all used to this um, way of interacting. Um, I'm happy to see India. I'm in Italy right now. She's in England, but I would love to be in a room and see all of you, but this will have to do. Um, so, India, I'll dive right into your um, beautiful book that just came out, an entertaining story. We see it here on screen. I have a copy with me. Um, and this is your third book, fourth book? Well, it's my third with Rizzoli, which I like because I'm a Virgo. So of course I like nice, neat things. And this is a nice, neat series. So the first was Island Life. Then there was a slice of England, tiny slice of England. And now there's an entertaining story. So the three look really nice together. But so you just said you're a Virgo, so you have an incredible attention to detail, yet I would like to start by, it's, I think it's a subtitle of one of your chapters, and it reads, there is no time for perfect. And I think this is the best um, line about uh, entertaining and women who love entertaining like I do, because I feel that we always pretend that, you know, it's so easy and everything needs to be perfect. And I think this book really is about real women entertaining and what the behind the scene for these real women entertaining is all about and literally coming to the very last minute without, you know, and realizing you forgot this and that and um, somewhere else in your book, you also say, I, you know, the last time we all slept was probably 1997, which doesn't help with, but um, so tell us all about um, how you conceive this book and how it really happens for real women. Oh gosh, and coming from you, I, I, I love that because I know only too well that you relate to so much of that. Uh, you've got young kids, you have a very strong business, you've launched your own uh, magazine, you are an entrepreneur, um, and, and we, we have somehow set ourselves up for this crazy life. Um, interestingly, I think lockdown and what's happened to the world um, made us all pause for one minute and think, what on earth were we doing? Uh, we were running through airports with these crazy schedules and trying to do everything. What, what is interesting, Martin, is I wrote the book actually way before lockdown, but so much of what I write in it actually is, is quite relevant for where we are now as a world. Um, and, I, and, and, and I do say there's no time for perfect. Of course I'm a Virgo, so I love perfect everything. I love to iron, I love to hoover. I can't cook, can't do that, but I do like ironing and hoovering because they're, 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 they're instant gratification. Um, but I, I, rather in the cabana style, and anyone on this call who is a, is, understands cabana knows that there's a very strong point of view to Martina and the sense of, of design and the layering that happens there. I love, love it. Because what you have allowed us all to do is, is relax more. And you, you, Cabana Magazine and the family of Cabana Magazine have said, it's okay not to be perfect. And so I think I've probably put, I've probably stolen a bit from you actually, um, in the fact that when we lay a table, we're now finding it's all right if you don't have the matching napkins. It's okay to have a little bit of chipped cutlery, uh, chipped crockery. It's okay if your, your glasses don't match. In fact, nowadays it's kind of cool. It is kind of cool that we mix all that. Of course, there are evenings, there are moments where we want a beautiful white starch tablecloth. We want our grandfather's silver. We want beautiful new crystal glasses. But I think for the most part, 
I like to set a table that feels warm and inviting. And, and, and also particularly during lockdown, I had this weird thing that life had to go on and we couldn't let it all become stop, stop at a standstill. And so I kept laying tables for my kids who, by the way, um, because I'm such a shit cook, um, my poor kids had to start learning to cook in order for us not to go utterly hungry. Um, David, my other half, is actually, he's quite competent at doing what he calls bachelor food. So he can actually roast a chicken and he can actually uh, grill a piece of steak. Um, but my kids were brilliant. And if, let, for example, Amy, my 20 year old said, right, I'm going to learn to do a cheese souffle, which was pretty outstanding. The fact that he took that on, not the cheese souffle, because he muddled cream and milk, by the way. Um, make sure you're not doing that when you're making a your cheese souffle. Um, but I thought, my God, if he's going to bother to make cheese souffles for us, I'm going to bother to lay a table. Even though it was literally David, me and my five kids, we said, we're going to lay the table. And so I think there was a sort of, there's a sort of pre-COVID entertaining and a post-COVID entertaining, but there's also something in the middle there about we're doing this for our families and we're doing this for ourselves. We're not necessarily doing this for a lar larger audience. I possibly have digressed from the beginning of the conversation where you I think may have asked me a question, which I can't even remember now. The question was about, no, it was no question. It was really about there is no time for perfect. We might now have a bit more time for perfect, but as I said, I think we don't want perfect any longer. We feel it's okay not have perfect, but I also feel that with the chaos that's happening out there in the world, our homes, and as you said, I think me too, I was laying tables, even if it was just, you know, me and my little daughter, I think there's something to be said about we wanted our life and our houses to feel okay and to feel more cozy, cozier than, than they were before. And I think, but to have cozy and to have all that, I think one needs time. And I think we all, as you said before, I think we all rediscovered what it means to take things slowly and do things with, at, a certain, um, at a certain pace. But you seem to really, I think, you know, to all the women out there watching us now, um, I think what, what's really interesting if, and you know, the lucky ones who are getting the free book, the first 50, great for you. If not, order it now and make sure to read it. Take some time to read in this book, because I think we all, you know, get these books, illustrated books and look at images and then leave them there. And then maybe remember to look at them, you know, a year later. No, I think you should really read it because it's in, in this text that, you know, um, the stories come to life and, and she's an incredible storyteller. Um, but you really make it sound extremely easy for all of us and for every woman to whether, you know, to how to face, for example, the unexpected. I think living on an island, you say, of course, there's a lot of unexpected. I think probably growing up in England, you grow up sort of knowing how to um, manage the unexpected with the weather. But um, so, yes, here we are. What's happening in this picture that um, we're looking at um, well, on the what, left? What's happening in that picture is a damas. That's what's happening is that I, I, you know, I lay that table and I thought, oh my God, this could be a fantastic book cover. We were looking to shoot the cover at that stage. Um, and I thought, let's take this one step further. Oh my God, let's have cocktails by the beautiful tree as the sun sets. And in the book, I do encourage everybody to, to think a little bit outside of the book um, in, in an unexpected way. Don't always lay a predictable table. Don't always have your dining table set up in the same place. Move it around, have fun with it, even if it's for just your own family. Think about having drinks in different places because it does bring a little bit more of a sense of excitement. Look, of course, we are only talking about, uh, about entertaining, but nevertheless, you know, if we're going to bother, then let, let's have fun with it. There's so thought, self-isolation self there as well. There's definitely self-isolation here because we, what idiot wants to join me as the tide comes in? No one, because you can see, look, my skirt's getting wet. Um, so the key here was to check your tide charts because the, when we started photographing, it looked sensational. And then by the end of it, we're all damp and feeling a little silly. Um, but the point also is, it's unexpected. It's, 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 it's okay to be going with the flow of doing something that idiotic. Um, and in actual fact, after we'd taken that photograph, we all sat around there. We got a couple more chairs. I had my two best great girlfriends who do, who do the photography and the videography. And we sat there and we drank. There is a bottle of champagne hiding behind those flowers. And we sat there and we really did just enjoy that moment. So yes, it was set up for a photograph. But yes, at the end of the day, we just actually sat there and enjoyed that moment. The other picture... Um, and I always get overexcited and start to talk way too fast. But the other picture um, 
is in a, is in our garage. I know that sounds absurd, but this is a real example of you know ch choose an unexpected place to set up your table. These are folding tables I bought from Amazon. They cost absolutely nothing. Those are folding chairs. They're slightly uncomfortable, but that's okay because they look damn good. Um, and, and that is just one piece of continuous cloth that I was gonna recover a sofa in and then I decided it didn't quite work. So I've used it as a tablecloth. Um, those are bamboo things I found on sale again from Amazon, I think. The flowers are in jam jars and mustard pots that I've just cleaned out. So it's all, it's all pretty casual. There's nothing super, super special about that. But- and A lot of recycling. I, a, a lot of recycling and upcycling. Yes. Upcycling, mustard pots as vases. But this was for um, just after um, my beloved aunt had died and we wanted to have a family dinner um, for my mother with all of our cousins around her, um, just to make her feel that, you know, she was incredibly close to my aunt and I didn't want her to feel that actually with the death of my aunt, family life would drift away, um, the cousins would drift away. So it was important that we did this dinner and I didn't have enough room in my house to host it. So we decided let's do it in the garage. So we moved out the cars swept out the floor very quickly. And the, those are the logs that we, we bring in to put on the fire, obviously. Um, and we just set up the table in there and we hung, we found a funny old oil painting of David's that had been in storage. And we hung that on the wall. We just nailed a, nailed a pin in, a, not a pin, a nail. We nailed a nail in and we hung an oil painting on the wall. And actually it looked sensational. Again, not actually so perfect because my mother with her beautiful bouffant and lots of Elmet hairspray, was inside my house and had to come across to the garage. And of course it was just in the season as summer, autumn was really turning into winter and it was freezing cold and the bouffant went woof, back like that. But that's all right, she made, it into, she made it into the garage. But then there was another unexpected moment because of the weather, something happened, a storm or something, was it that? It, that's exactly right. So, so with, with the hair, actually, I have to confess that all the little bread buns on the table also blew off. So, so that it, was, it was very unexpected. But, you know, at the end of the day, the, the, the takeaway from this evening was, yes, of course, I, I felt that I had successfully managed to host a dinner in a garage. But it was all about the fact that actually it was, it was family coming together. And so really, my mother's hair, the losing of the bread buns, it was all fine because it was about, it was about family coming together and us remembering my aunt and being with my mother and supporting her there. Um, so India, uh, starting with this, with this um, table, and there's quite a lot of family entertaining in your book. Um, moments, um, both in England and in the Bahamas. So for our audience, our virtual audience, um, do's and don'ts of family gatherings. Oh God. Okay. Oh. What was um, this? What is this? Oh, this is, this is, this. This is also again for my mother. So yes, Martin, you've absolutely hit it. You know, family life to me is, is the backbone of my entire existence. I've got five kids. Um, that, 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 that is a mistake, by the way, everybody. That's way too many. Um, they, they're, they're, they're nuts. Um, and, and this was my mother's 90th, which we, um, we did again in my home in England. And again, I didn't have the space to have the whole family. So I simply rented a funny little marquee that's called a Chinese hat. And it's very inexpensive and it's all pointy like that, but it's small and tiny. And you can roll up the sides if it's in the summer and you can have them down the winter. And I started to use this quite a lot because it felt like an additional dining room, but I didn't have to go to the expense of actually building a bloody dining room. So this, this thing is just that a local company come, they pop it up, they have lovely strong men who put it up and take it away again. And it is literally like an additional dining room. So you can see the same chairs and the same tables, but on this occasion, um, I wanted to have some color in that. Actually, I just launched that collection, um, those red napkins, um, when I had my lovely, lovely lifestyle brand, which I no longer have, which broke my heart, but I had a wonderful six years of working with these incredible women across America. And we sold all, all these collections. And so that, that was a tableware collection that I just launched. So I wanted to bring flowers that were gonna talk to the collection. But again, I didn't want to go to a vast expense and we didn't have a huge budget for this evening. Um, and so I suddenly thought, you know what? I have an ex-brother-in-law who owns a garden center. And so I rang him up and I said, any possibility that I might for your ex-mother-in-law borrow some plants? Um, and so there's slightly strange uh, green, the greenery on the table came from him and I went, borrowed them, nothing happened to them. And then we just took them back to the garden center and hopefully they were sold the next week. So I always say, beg and borrow as much as you possibly can when entertaining and change it up just for yourself. Don't always have the same look and feel. You can change it up pretty inexpensively. Um, and there's a chapter in your book about using red 
uh, as it is here in, in the tables, then there's a bit of blue. What are you, how are you laying your tables now? Is there any sort of color mood? You know what's so lovely about this tour is Martina is somebody that we all admire because of all the reasons I've just said. She's a phenomenally busy woman. And I think she's actually read my book. I really do. She yeah, actually I did. I can also tell you, we can tell a story about, you said just now, having five kids, it's a lot. It's crazy. What about, what happened to your grandmother? What did she do with her two daughters in Hungary? <laughs> um, uh, in, in, in Budapest, um, she, my grandmother was a very extraordinary character, um, a remarkable, remarkable woman and a great hostess and, and entertained a huge amount as well. Um, and she was particularly remarkable because she began her life um, as a wonderful, great beauty and a, a very recognized heiress who wanted for nothing because she had everything. But she was an adventurer and a traveler and, and she explored parts of the world that white women had never even been to. And she was, she was just amazing but very frivolous, um, had lots of affairs along the way, brought back many exotic animals, and wasn't particularly what we would call now a hands-on mother. But later in life, uh, she became passionate about helping other people and really dedicated her life to the children of the world. My mother always says she didn't necessarily dedicate herself to her own children, but she certainly dedicated herself to the children of the world. And she really worked herself to death and died very early on a uh, at the age of 59 in, in Borneo on a St. John ambulance trip that she did. But she was remarkable in the fact that she went out to, um, after the war, um, with the Japanese surrender, she went into the concentration camps. She was the first woman out there and she was really working on behalf of, 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 the, of the government and getting the, the prisoners of war released. And she was ab absolutely remarkable. But as we said, and as uh, Martina alluded to, a little forgetful about her own children and when, once traveling through Budapest and Hungary, I think um, she felt that there was, I think that there was a war or a crisis coming in. And, and she felt, you know, actually it might be best if I just drop the girls off. My mother and aunt were dropped off in a hotel in Kekes, I think it was called Kekesh. Um, and, and she dropped them with the nanny and the governess and she thought she would come back, you know, a few weeks later and off she went on her merry way. And then she forgot quite where she had dropped them. Um, and so my mother and aunt with their nanny and governess were left there, not for a few weeks, but for six months. Um, and when I say to my mother, you know, this is just extraordinary. I mean, did you, and my mother, of course, being very British, she just says, you know, darling, it, you know, it was fine. We managed, we coped. But it must have been quite strange not to see your mother for six months and for your, your mother to actually really just absentmindedly forget about the girls or just leave them there thinking they were perfectly safe. My mother tells amazing stories of going into the forests and looking for foxes and, and bears and all sorts of things. But of course, in this day and age, we're all horrified by the idea because we're, we're helicopter parents and imagine just dropping our kids off. Actually, Martina, I have to tell you, I told that story at a, at a, at a, at a design show um, and, and I had said about, you know, leaving them for six months and virtually sort of abandoning your children. There were two women in the front who just looked aghast, aghast. And they came up to me afterwards. And I said, oh, God, I'm so sorry. Were you terribly shocked about that story of my grandfather, the grandmother? And they said, not at all. We were trying to work out where we could drop our children off for six months. <laughs> exactly. Well, maybe we can give advice later. Um, but OK, so I think. I think there's something also to be said about you're really good. It comes really natural to you, your flower arrangement. There's an art to that. I'm really bad at that. I might call you next time. I mean, whenever we'll be allowed to entertain properly. But you do it really naturally. And it, it's sort of always very, it's, it's beautiful and it's effortless. And then there as well, I think, I don't know, there's a picture at some point, you come up with ideas again of upcycling, there's sort of red carnation flowers in a perfume bottle, in an olive oil bottle, and how, how do you do it? And last time I was, I was there with you in Oxfordshire, you had just done a beautiful uh, composite flower uh, arrangement, cutting flowers from your mom's garden. Look well, at that. Well, I, I think, think I recognize this dinner on the left, yeah. I think you do. I think you very much do. Um, I think, you know, I, I, I'm sitting in the library of David Hicks, who, you know, we can all, um, we can all uh, uh, agree was one of the most extraordinary decorators, certainly in the 60s and 70s. And he led the way with his, you know, and his vision and his idea and his passion. Um, 
And, you know, I think growing up around that, you inherit part of it. Clearly, I didn't inherit the brain. My brother got that fair share. Um, I, I am, you know, no, I can't remember a bloody thing. I can't remember a goddamn date. Um, and, and my brother can remember absolutely everything. But I guess, um, you know, I, I, I do enjoy fiddling around with, with creative bits. Um, uh, and, uh, and again, you know, in a, on a very, very small scale. And I think if you enjoy something, then, then hopefully you can feel creative about it and, and, and confident about it. Because, you know, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a flower ranger, but I have fun with it. Um, and I try lots of different things. So in one of those pictures, you'll see that I've hung vases from a tree um, and then put the lights around it on a big branch. Um, others, rather hideous colored flowers there on the left-hand side. But again, they were free because we had a neighbor who'd moved out of their house and I nipped into their garden with a pair of shears uh, and borrowed their flowers because they actually the house was between two, two buyers um, and not colors that I'd normally choose. But since they were free, we liked that. Um, and then the, the central one is, is at home on the terrace in the Bahamas. And again, that, again, Mother Nature often provides and it was mango and sugar apple season. And so it just seems so fun to lay the palm fronds directly onto the table. Nothing was in vases here. And I just put the mangoes and the sugar apples down the center of the table. Uh, and then we, we were able to make a lot of mango cocktails for the following week. In fact, that's a very good example, that table there. Um, of a, a, another trick that we have, which is it's got the, it's underneath is a very narrow table. Again, a folding one that we store under one of our houses. I love the way I say under one of our houses that I have hundreds of houses. We have, we have a few homes in the Bahamas that we rent out as a business, but we do sometimes store our things under those houses. But when, when I want a wider table, we simply have a piece of plywood that we then lay on the top, completely raw, un, unfinished plywood that sits on the top. And then we put obviously the tablecloth on top. So that's an easy way of extending a table. But on this particular one, I hadn't even laid the table. Those are simply just um, melamine plates. So very easy with a napkin and a knife and fork laid on the top um, because it was one of those quick evenings where I just said, right, well, we're inviting some friends around uh, and we're not gonna make it super fancy. Um, and what about those chairs? Very interesting, very beautiful. Are they folding chairs as well or? Completely folding ch bamboo chairs again from Amazon. Um, I, you know, in the Bahamas, we can't get anything. They're, they're, we're very, very limited, which kind of makes you quite resourceful at times and kind of makes you very infuriated at other times. Um, but we've had these bamboo chairs a long time because they, they just, they, they go with everything. And I think they, they give the atmosphere of, of a tropical evening. Um, and sometimes when we like our guests very much, we'll give them a nice cushion to sit on and we'll tie them onto the chairs. And other times we just say, oh, bloody hell, and leave it, leave it, leave them with their bare bums sitting on the bamboo. I remember Not that. Right, their bare bottoms, as you know what I mean. Um, India, I think let's stay on these pictures for a second. Because I think, I mean, you know, we're all very grateful to Circa Lighting for hosting us today. And um, there is something, I think, to be said. It's about lighting for, a, especially for a dinner. Um, dinner outside, dinner inside, um, sort of cocktail party. How do you, I mean, there's, you love candlelit dinners, clearly. Um, but how do you, um, what's, your, what's your view on lighting for um, entertaining? I think, I think um, in the incredibly important, um, and again, I'm so aware that we are, we're not curing cancer here, we're talking about entertaining at a very tricky time in the world. But it's all about, um, it's about creating an atmosphere. And if, if we are able to even, in, even right now have a bubble of six come over, or if, we are a, if we're lucky enough to be able to have a meal with our family or extended family, then and now, I, I want to create an atmosphere where people go away thinking, that was lovely. What a lovely evening that was. And I think part of that whole thing is, is lovely food, good music, interesting conversation, a plasma, and good Great. lighting. And drinks, oh my God, and drinks, but good lighting in it. Um, and so uh, you can see there are lots of different ways that I, I've lit, like from everything from tying it into the branch of the tree or, or those big hurricane lanterns on the table. Um, and circa lighting are, are, the, are the queen, I nearly said the king of this, but probably the queen of this. Um, and in fact, I have a couple of their lamps inside my home as well. My father was very keen on lighting. Um, and, and, and paid special attention to it. So it, again, it's something that I have very much inherited in the idea that 
you want to create an atmosphere with lighting. Um, and, and as I said, you want people to go away feeling that was lovely and lighting's a part of that. So we said it's lighting, it's drinks. You start your book with drinks at the beginning of an evening, everything. That's everything. Well, I, I, said, I started then, with the most important meal of the day, which is drinks. Yes, and then placement or the seating plan. Um, I'm always, I'm obsessed with that. I think there's, even when you have only six people, I think it's crucial, A, who you have around the table. And it's crucial to have people who start conversations and either keep it up or just, you know, oh, there we are. I mean, sorry, there's an art to this as well for you. Look at you. Look at me, look at me. Um, what we're saying is look at, look at the state of me. I'm in a sort of, a, a sort of <laughs> on the floor. Um, yes, and, and you know what? When I, when I was writing about this in the book, I kind of paused and thought, do I sound like some sort of ridiculous, snotty old lady talking about plasma um, or the seating plan? And then I, then I thought, no, like you, Martina, I do think, I do think it's important because I think, again, what makes a dinner and, you know, gosh, long gone are those days as we see here of uh, a dramatic. All those, all those names around the table. Yeah. And, and, and now we're back down to, to our bubbles of six. But as you say, even with bubble of six, it is important. And, and I think the art of conversation, you know, comes and goes. Um, and, and sitting next to somebody interesting and learning something new or being inspired by someone is so, is so wonderful. And, and that comes down to a good hostess thinking through, right, who have I got coming to dinner? And I always make the point that, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so lucky in so many incredible ways, but I'm so lucky that I live on a very interesting island. And, and we have so many extraordinary characters come through the island. And Captain Bob has become a very, very dear friend of mine. And he's a local fishing, fisherman. He used to be a captain of a, of a, a lobster crayfish boat. Um, and he, you know, the crayfish were the most valuable thing that you have out in, in our oceans around, around where I live. And so he would literally um, have guns on board because they would be pirates, modern day pirates. Um, I kid you not, who obviously come to attack the boats to take the crayfish. Crazy, of course. Um, and I've never met a captain who carried a gun on a boat before um, and now has become a wonderful friend of ours he's been bitten by sharks he's been struck by lightning and you know the first time I met Captain Bob I was like you know oh my god I had no idea about these fantastic stories that he carries and only because I sat myself down and, and had him next to me at a dinner did I suddenly realize this is just amazing and, and so I think when you actually sit next to somebody and engage in the conversation, you discover all these extraordinary stories they have. And from every background, everybody. Uh, I think my mother always said that, you know, you can never be bored by somebody if you ask them about themselves because people normally have something very interesting to say. And very rarely are you, you know, are people asked about themselves. You normally hear the other person talking about himself or herself. Um, and I think, as you said, it's also adding a bit of unexpected to the guest list. Well, I'm also, on it, I'm looking at those pictures now, I'm also adding quite a lot of unexpected there. That there are some success stories here and some not such a su successful ones. Um, but I do see your name at the bottom there. Yeah, those, are, those, that. those are a whole heap of postcards. Um, my mother um, left her set at Albany in London and my father, of course, um, had had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of postcards printed of, 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 the, of the original building as it was in whatever year it was. Um, I wouldn't dream of trying to guess. And, um, and when, and when they left, they were left with all these postcards. We said, what are we going to do with these postcards? They're slightly redundant now. So I made them into, I made them into place cards um, and then big pebbles. And then the, that's dominoes in the top, in the top right-hand corner. Domino, um, my daughter, who's now 12, but at the time probably about eight, uh, wanted to host a dinner party. I don't know if that's terrifying or if that's encouraging, um, but she had her friends come over and then she did the, she did the little name pairs and then she put a, a hint of glitter on them. I've used luggage labels, which you can see there. I've used just plain craft paper. I've hand calligraphied myself. In the book though, it is, it is important to mention that there is, there's, there's a lot of things that I think have worked very well. There's also a lot of things that I think haven't worked very well. And you did mention that I had a red party one time and a girlfriend had given me this brown tablecloth and then I put all these mother nature again. Um, the flame trees were in bloom then. So I cut all these branches and put it down and it just looked horrible. It looked like a Hawaiian wedding, which I love, 
love a Hawaiian wedding if you're in Hawaii, but that was not the look I was going for. So there, there, are, there, are, there are pluses and minuses. There are success stories and not such successful stories in this book as but well. You, there's a great success story, I think, towards the end of the book, which, I mean, I think it's quite recent. It's about a year ago, and it was probably your last big um, entertaining moment in the Bahamas. And it was for a very good cause. I think um, you did a very big fundraising. It was it New Year's Eve? Um, yes. And, and again, yeah. thank you for mentioning that. Um, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just trying to pick up the picture. Actually, there we go. Um, uh, there, that is the... Uh, I'm probably, you probably can't even see my little tiny screen, but in, in the book, as Martina's... I, I think if we, um, you know, if we flick down, probably go towards the end oh, of the slides, uh, whoever is managing the slides, here we are. This right? is absolutely perfect. This is exactly the page. And, and, and Martina's right. Um, we had, um, last September in the Bahamas, we had a, 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 a terrible, devastating hurricane on such proportions that the mind boggles to think what happened. Um, I live on Harbour Island. It's a very small island, three miles long, half mile wide. And, and we were all under hurricane warning. We could all see it coming. And, and by, by the grace of God, we were missed. But 70 miles away, just 70 miles away, neighboring islands to us were obliterated, wiped out. And I can say that because I went there very soon afterwards. And it makes me actually kind of emotional thinking about it to see what I saw. Um, and, and the death and destruction of, the, of that hurricane um, left a very big impact on me. And I realized that actually I, I needed to, to actually um, do, do something. Um, and I got involved with an amazing organization called the Global Empowerment Mission. Um, and they're a disaster relief agency. And I knew nothing about disaster relief. I knew very little about, um, about, about um, uh, disaster agencies and charities. Um, I'd done a lot of fundraising before, but I got really involved with them. And I learned so much about where to give your money and which agencies you can trust and how rapid response works and all sorts of boring things that I won't go into now. But what I did realize was these, these aren't things that just start and stop. They have to continue. The islands out there still, there are still people today living under canvas tents. There are still people without a home. And, and, and these are people who, who you know, I, I have become um, very familiar with and, and have followed their story through. And it's just heartbreaking. And I think we cannot deny that climate change is here and it is real. And what we're seeing is not going to change. Hurricanes are going to get worse. Fires are going to increase. And, and we, we need to be proactive. And so I, I, I recognized that I wanted to get on board and I wanted to stay and be consistently helping. And so at Christmas time, I thought I'm trying to lighten the mood because it just it can get a little oh when you think about what's going on. Um, but at Christmas, I, I realized that actually I, I could possibly open up my home and we could host a dinner and people could come and we could spend Christmas together and, and people could donate towards the Global Empowerment Mission. Um, and, and, and we had the most fantastic evening and people were so utterly generous and kind in, in helping me host this evening. Um, and, and this was a team effort and it was just a, a wonderful, wonderful night. And we raised a lot of money and that money has gone to actually building a school. Um, so there now is actually a physical school out on Abaco um, which comes from this evening and some of the kids are now back in school and I only say some because of course now we're living under the oppressive time of COVID but that school came back and we recognized that kids have to get back into a routine and we have to continue educating them. The worst thing was those kids who were out of school for so long after that hurricane and they had no power, no electricity, no computers, no nothing, no support. Um, and so it was just amazing to see that. And now, of course, we've actually started a food bank um, because not only has the poor Bahamas suffered so badly from this hurricane um, and all the islands suffered because obviously there's the two islands that got affected, but then the people, you know, something like 60,000 people had to rehabilitate and so other islands were now taking refugees in um and and it was just uh, an incredible and difficult year for the bahamas and now we're facing you know a lockdown and no tourism and 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 it's happening again right now on harbor island there are some very difficult decisions being made because um uh, the uh, coronavirus is beginning to to spread around the bahamas and 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 there is the ongoing debate that every government is facing is do, do you open up and continue with a some kind of a working economy or do you shut down? And I, you know, I don't know what the answer is, but all I do know is that we were able to help with setting up a food bank. And so that's a very different extreme to the global empowerment. It was on a much smaller scale. But again, people have been so incredibly generous with giving to that. And if anybody is interested, um, we've got a GoFundMe that's called um, 
the Bryland Food Bank and, and very easy to find it on my Instagram account. It's there on my profile. But people have been very generous in donating to that because we have been able to, to, to help a lot of people who began to feel some serious food insecurity. And I think it's a great lesson for all of us to what you did because it, it is helping your, starting by helping your community, the people you know, the people around you and, and sort of gathering, um, gathering awareness uh, around that and around, and around the people close to you. Um, I think, I mean, I've been asking you to, way too many questions. I think we should move on to and see if someone in our audience, I mean, I, I'm not sure if we'll see the face of people asking questions. I don't know. Um, and I don't think so, unfortunately, but let's see if there are questions coming in. Um, so I there see one. Is, yep. I'm not sure if I'm doing this right, <laughs> but there is a question which is, do you always use place cards? So great question. Um, I think again, it depends on kind of the evening that you're having and probably people didn't know that they could ask questions. So if you want to chat, if you want to type into the chat box, Martina can pick up on these questions. Um, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to have the answers. Um, and I know someone is also answering on behalf of Circa who are hosting this, but um, do I always use place cards? No. If it's a small dinner, I like to just say, why don't you sit here and why don't you sit there? Um, but I like details. So any excuse to use a place card, I'll do it. So I think if you're sort of beginning to get beyond sort of 12 people or more, you can. Because also there's that weird, awkward bit where you're standing, you've just gone into dinner and your hostess is saying, okay, now you, and you're all slightly standing on the edge waiting. And it, sometimes it feels like you're being waiting to be picked for the tent netball team. So if there's a place card, you simply go around and find your place and you can sit down immediately. Oh, okay. Then we have Hay from Scotland. How do you make a table feel sunny when the British weather can be so miserable? Oh God, great question. And Julie, Scott, I went to school in Scotland. I went to Gordonston, so I love Scotland. Um, and I'm very aware of your weather. Um, actually, of course, I, I, I'm so English that I kind of love the weather and embrace it. Um, making it feel sunny. I think again, it's, it, if you have a good cocktail in hand, some great music on, good lighting and a beautifully set table, I think you begin to forget about the weather. Um, it's just the arrival and the departure that can be a little painful. But forget about the weather. It's all about the drinks. It's all about the drinks. Yes. Um, so then there's, okay, you said there is no time for perfect, but you love to iron. I think great design has that same juxtaposition. Something's perfect, something's relaxed. How do you determine what should be perfect and what should be more casual? Now, I have, I have an anecdote for this because I remember when, you know, I've been lucky enough to meet uh, Min Hogg, who's the founder of World of Interiors, a great, I think, friend of your father. And I also, I had just started Cabana. I was so nervous of meeting her. And, you know, she was holding my magazine and sort of flicking through it. And I said to her, how did you choose the houses you would feature and you would publish in the magazine? She said, I always wanted every room to, to have something out of place. And I think that's the perfect answer to what her concept of the world of interiors was, of course, has been an inspiration for all of us. But that I think is a bit of a, a sort of reply to that. And, you know. And very clever. Very and make it personal. And, 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 and clever again, and, and I think, it, it, again, it comes back into the world, the, the family of Cabana, and I love that you always use that word, Martina, in the beginning, you always talk about the, the Cabana family, um, and something out of place. I mean, Cabana is, is not usual, um, and I talk about unexpected, and Cabana is certainly unexpected as well. And, and, and you, you find that, there, that some of the pages, as you turn the magazine, you, you'll suddenly find that something feels a little out of place, but in a good way. Um, and so that just definitely ties back. I would also say, in answer to that question, it's up to you. It's what feels good for you. Um, you know, I used to be terribly self-conscious about how everything looked and felt. And now I'm much, much more relaxed uh, again. And, you know, it doesn't matter if the napkin doesn't match. It's OK. It's all OK. So it's probably your own personal, um, your own personal feeling. Yeah. Um, so then there are two questions about large and extended dining tables. So one is, what do you use for the large and extended dining table? And then related to that, there's another question. When I've dined at very long tables, people seem to shout to talk to others down at the other end. Any hints for this? 
So uh, large and extended dining tables, I, I already uh, mentioned the trick of putting the plywood on top of your existing table, that, that, will, that will extend it. And sometimes when I don't have a tablecloth that fits that, I'll either use sheets, I know, sounds bizarre, I'll take sheets, iron them, put them over it, um, and, or a bed or a bedspread, um, again, just to add it up, because it's, it's extra wide and it makes it wide. Um, and then the other, the other second part of that question, what was it, Martina? Um, and there's so many questions. To shout to talk to oh. others down at the other end. Yes, yes. Yes, and sometimes that's slightly irritating, isn't it? Especially if they're shouting across you. Um, I that don't. That would happen in Italy for sure. People would start shouting at one another. <laughs> so I don't have the answer to that. What's your answer to that? Well, in America as well, I think people are, people do tend to. In England, we're far too reserved. Um, but maybe shouting brings a good atmosphere. I don't know. I love Italians shouting. I think after a few drinks, probably people will start shouting. But there again, I think it's about the seating arrangement, the plan. You know, if you're, if you're happy with your neighbors, um, I think you don't really need to shout at the other end of the table. Yeah. Um, the English have it, did do it really well, that thing of talking to, on your left and then switching on the right after the next course comes. Um, so, um, you use amazing long tables. There's a lot of questions about that. Um, although it's not relevant now, cause we can't, I'm afraid we can't have those long tables. Is that a British preference? Aren't they hard to serve to? Americans seem to go for lots of round tables. Do you know what? It's so odd. I, I, I do, I, I sort of recognize that, that I, I started these long tables and that I think has, is born out of the fact that I've, I've lived on this small island for 25 years. Um, and what happens is you you'll invite some friends over and because a lot of people on the island are, are holidaying or have holiday homes they'll have extended family or guests of guests and so you don't ever end up with the 12 that you invite you end up with the 24 or 36 or whatever it is because everybody's bringing so many so we started to just to, to extend and extend and because i am so lucky in being able to eat outside in that climate you can have these long tables just drifting down the garden um, or the driveway um, and it for it to become very dramatic. Having said that though, I think there is going to be a real trend towards round tables again, um, because I think we're talking about entertaining COVID times and bubbles and getting back to feeling much more intimate. So I will certainly be looking uh, for round table solutions. Yes. Good. Well, I, I went for a round table here in, in, in Milan. What is your go-to menu for a seated dinner with friends? Um, well, the, 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 the key is not to have me cook. That's, that's definite. Um, I am, again, incredibly lucky to have a top banana. Um, been with us for 15 years. Uh, she's kind of intimidating. Um, she rules the roost in the kitchen. Um, and she is, um, uh, she's certainly not a chef, but she's a very excellent home cook. Um, and so she will often serve comfort food, which I think, again, particularly now is something we're looking for. So a chicken pot pie or a shepherd's pie, that kind of thing. Nothing pretentious. We don't, we never try to go fancy or pretentious with our food. Um, so then someone else from Miami, if you're short in space, what are must have items? Linens, plates, glasses, trays, vases? And that's a brilliant question as well, because I'm always aware that, you know, I, again, I, as I said, we kind of sometimes store our things underneath the house. Um, there are people who are entertaining in, in tiny apartments in New York City and entertaining beautifully in their tiny apartments in New York City. But where on earth do you keep all this stuff? Um, there are lots of clever tricks to that. I went to somebody's house in Paris recently and they had a library and then they had this fake bookshelf here and they pushed it like that. And actually out came like one of those larder shelves and all of their glassware was in this sort of fake library shelf. It was genius. Um, we don't all have that. I think there's something quite clever about borrowing from friends in the same way that, you know, remember we always used to borrow each other's clothes when we were in school or growing up or annoying your sister. I think that there's something about borrowing each other's linens because you get bored of your own or you might not have enough. So ring up a neighbor and say, do you have extra knives or do you have a fun water jug or whatever it is. So you don't have to have all this stuff in your own home. Um, borrow. Borrow, that's a great idea. Yeah. I always say that by changing the, the tablecloth or the placemat, I'm a huge fan of placemats. Um, you set a different mood each time. Um, okay, then what is the perfect width of a table? We're getting very technical here. 
Oh, oh my God, look, you know, I, I'm a total dimwit. I, can, I don't even know measurements. I look, I, I look, I visualize. But then again, I, I think in centimeters, so. Um, it's very alarming. There's a telephone ringing. Um, oh, no, no, my 91-year-old mother got it. She's very quick. She's very quick on the phone and she picks it up and then she can't hear who's on the end of the phone. So she's then stranded, but she still picks up the phone. Anyway, I don't have to. We can keep going, Martina. Very okay, fine. thank you. I mean, there are so many questions. Someone maybe from Cirque at some point needs to stop us if we're going, okay, how long do you, how long do you like to stay seated at dinner? 10 minutes. No. <laughs> Was that 10 minutes more or 10 minutes seated at the dinner? Um, 10 minutes seated at the dinner. I think again, you just judge, you judge. If people seem to be really enjoying themselves, then you know, why would you want to stop an evening? If everybody's got onto the topics of politics or religion, I would say get up from the table very quickly. Yes. And I'm just slightly watching the time here. Um, we're, we, we've probably got about another 15 minutes. So I don't know how many more slides we've got. I'm gonna let you be the boss of that. Okay, well, lots of questions here. Recommendation, let's, let's do it like a quick, um, question answer recommendation for pre dinner cocktail to serve. Uh, 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 what's the uh, pre cocktail to serve? Um, pre dinner cocktail to yeah, what's the, your ideal cocktail to serve? By my, by my book, there are a couple of great ideas in there for cocktails to serve. And and recipes, um, but, uh, but I, think, I, I think, again, have fun with it. In England, we serve a lot of pims. I love pims. It's got the mint in there. It, it, it makes you think you're not drinking alcohol, and then the next day you realize you really have. So pims would be my number one go-to. So then there's someone asking, I'll answer this one. Can you share any of your favorite brands and or small businesses that you love to purchase table linens, plates, and other entertaining needs from? Try Cabana. <laughs> no um yeah well we we offer that but um but there, I, there's lots i i love looking at, at stuff on instagram and i sometimes end up buying table linens on, and, and plates on, on, and, and flea markets i i think you're absolutely right and i think that also um uh what is interesting is 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 legacy and inheriting beautiful things but also um uh, when I look at the cabana site for um, linens, I know, I know the kind of luxury level we're at because I've touched and felt them. And I know, I know the story behind it. So when you invest in a piece from, let's say, cabana, which I would advise everybody to do, obviously, um, that, that's a piece you're going to have for life. And that, that's an investment piece that you're also going to hand down to generation after generation. And I love that. And I think that that's where we're heading now in this time. Yes, fast fashion is unfortunately still here, but there is also the kind of legacy. And I love what you said, Martina, about, uh, about flea market finds. Um, I've got a whole set that I found in Wallingford, um, which is none of it matches, but it's all blue and white and all the blue and white looks good together. But I would happily put that with a cabana piece, a beautiful, um, a beautiful piece of crockery from you, uh, which then folds into the story of the antique from Wallingford. So I love a story as well in, in all of that. Yes, and mix flea market finds with, you know, Cabana and Zara Home. I love Zara Home, for instance. Um, but really, yeah, I think we should all mix it up. Um, do you ever use playlists when you entertain? You know, I love a playlist. I, I also love like a, a Christmas theme of music. David, my other half, just literally rolls his eyes at the idea of a playlist or Christmas. But I, 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 I will definitely put on a Christmas tune uh, during the holiday season. Um, so if I'm allowed, I would have a playlist, but I'm not allowed. What's your idea of a perfect tea party? Table food, again, whole chapter in your book to, to answer this question. I mean, literally, there's an entire chapter in the book on tea parties. I mean, my God, uh, I'm English. What can I say? Uh, my mother has had tea probably every afternoon of her adult life. Um, it's, it's a process. It's a tradition. Um, if it doesn't happen, God forbid, there will be chaos. The world would be unbalanced. Um, and and there's a there's a whole process to it. You you warm the pot first. You don't just put you don't just put the water in straight away. You warm the pot first. I'm not even going to go into it. Tea is an important meal of the day and one very recognised here in England. Um, and there are different types of tea. But again, you're going to have to buy my book to find out what types of tea there are. And I don't mean Indian Darjeeling or Lapsang Souchon. I mean 
cream tea or crumpet or when you would have a cucumber sandwich. Okay, this, I think we'll take this last question. What is your most personal favorite thing to set the atmosphere to welcome guests into our homes? Dogs and children. Um, I think if you have dogs and kids for the beginning of the evening, middle of the evening, end of the evening, for the entire evening, it makes people feel they're coming into your home and that you have invited them into your home. Um, and, and they're probably the two most important things in my life, my dogs and my kids. Great. Well, I think, I think, I mean, we've, we've replied to almost or, um, again, our napkin rings still on vogue. Shall we finish with this one? Cause I know you have a theory on napkin rings. I mean, you, you, you love using them right now in times of COVID. I do. I, you know, again, I'm living with my 91 year old mama, um, who has very much said she does not want isolation, but we are obviously being careful. Her opinion is, my God, she's lived for 91 years, you know, she doesn't want to have us isolated away where she can't see and be with us. So as Martina knows, we, we, are, we are careful. And when we lay the table, we lay my mama slightly, slightly further apart from all of us, but she's there in the middle um, and, and the head of the table. Um, but be, being as careful as we possibly can, we're very aware of washing our hands and making our face masks and all the rest of it. And I just suddenly thought, actually, you know, we're washing our hands and wiping our hands on our napkins and we're not going to be doing the laundry all the time. Um, and, and I'm always kind of debating, is it better to use a paper napkin that you're throwing away or is it better to have a napkin that you're washing? I'm never sure there's a, I know there's a debate on that and, and what, the, 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 what the kind of the, the makeup of the material of the paper napkin is. And we're not going into that right now, but I suddenly thought, you know what, going back to a napkin room is quite a nice, it's quite a nice throwback um, and also probably a very good solution. So you know, You've wiped your hands on your napkin and your napkin ring is around it. Great. I think we can wrap, up, wrap it up right now. I think we've, um, and, and if you have any other questions, I think really by, by India's book. And of course, um, we are uh, both Martina and I are, 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 are prolific on, on Instagram. And, and I think there's a reason for that as well, which is I, I like Instagram because I feel conversational, I feel in touch. And I think particularly right now where the world is wacky and weird, we need to be in touch with one another. Reasonable in touch things where we are, we are, we are remembering kindness and patience because at the moment, with the heated um, American election dawning. There are some, some people have forgotten their manners, but I think we, we, between Martina and I and Cabana, and certainly Circa, you will find um, comforting, warm, inclusive Instagram accounts. David always says to me, it's like sending a postcard. He loves to post a picture every now and then with a tiny bit of news. That's his way of putting out poster. But anyone who's got any more questions, please uh, go to my Instagram account and I'll be happy to answer them. And I know uh, both Cabana and Martina are always there with intelligent, sensible things um, on, their, on their Instagram accounts. Martina, my God, you're bloody good at this. No. Well, yes, I mean, you know, oh my God, the, it ran so taught me to go live and be on screen the whole time, uh, which I hated before. Uh, but I hope to see you soon, um, very soon. And thank you, everyone, for being here. I, I, I don't know who to thank, but and thank you so much, Circa Lighting, for hosting this and having us. Um, and um, have a great evening, India. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Circa, a wonderful, wonderful platform to be doing this on. And, um, and, and Martina, thank you for hosting it. And someone's just asked, what is the name of the new book? Very, very important part. An entertaining story. And I hope you'll find it is just that. Thank you, Martina. Thank you. Thank you, Gail.